moving right along here, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Chris McMurray, who's next up um, in the middle of our lunch and learn to give us a preview about the new responsibilities for leaders and to review that work of the Edu Jedi digital learning experience. So I'm going to let Chris just sort of let it rip. And I'm going to weigh in at the back end of that based on all these meetings we've been having very recently with the Edu Jedi on all these topics and what the feedback has been um, from them along the way. So Chris, I'm turning it over to you. I'm going to okay. put the first slide up. You're going to be talking about a lot of those concepts that were in awesome. the Edu Jedi dictionary. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, yeah, this is you. Just tell me when you want to click. I think I actually can pass you remote control. Can you give me remote control? We'll try yeah, it. Yeah, you are in control now, Chris. Okay. There you I go. Will, I will try it. I'll give it a go. Okay. So okay. while I'm while I'm uh, fiddling with the directional arrows on my keyboard here uh, to control the the slide deck, uh, very happy to be here. Super excited that that our last group. Um, uh, Dr. Burks really represented an interesting intersection between uh, teaching and learning, and and the the technology end of things. That that's uh, that's very um, it's exciting for me to hear that language, and and it's exciting to see that 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 is actually becoming much more common out here in in the world of education. Um, it's interesting that we that we are. Um, that we're all sort of uh, messing around with some of these logistics things. And, and so today, what I want to take a little bit of time with you um, to talk about is, is really the, the digital learning experience, um, how that re relates to some, some shifts in terms of, of design framework for, for learning, um, learning experience design, and, and then what that might, imp what, what that might mean for for changes in responsibilities within the system, and so the system really is has been designed for something that doesn't that doesn't really look like what we're talking about and and uh, uh, what Dr. Burks and her team are are doing. And so, I want to make sure that we can get into that a little bit today. I'm going to start with some some discussion about architecture. I want to give a little bit of background so that we have some context um, in terms of of how some of these things have have sort of materialized and, and started to show up on the on the landscape. And uh, uh, if I if I hadn't introduced myself previously, I'm, I was a I was previously a, an assistant superintendent, academic chief economic officer, and uh, and really sort of uh, began a lot of this work in in my districts and out there with other colleagues. So I uh, have been really doing this work for a long time and uh, I'm, in, I'm very excited to, to uh, join the Learning Council and uh, moving it forward. So, um, so I'm going to move on and um, assuming that I can move my, my mouse. Sorry. Lonnie, if you're still on, I can't. Uh, I don't actually have. And control. Chris, if you if you if you uh, hold your cursor over that screen, there should be little little faded oh. arrows at the bottom. Yeah. Hmm. To allow you to move it. Yep. I'm not seeing my arrows. Sorry. There you oh, go. There we go. I got a wheel. Excellent. Sorry, folks. For okay. those of you on the on the viewing end of this, uh, bear with me. So, um, so really what we're talking about is, is just what I mentioned before. We're moving beyond digital literacy. We're talking about, about digital learning experience. Um, we're talking about leveraging things like the internet um, technology and things that, that can offer that, that much more uh, nonlinear and, and rich experience. And, and it is way more than, than simply um, uh, designing uh, lessons. So I'm going to start with this, with this uh, document. And this is, is really something that was designed um, by the Learning Council to start to to describe um, objects, to describe learning um, objects. And so it, it really gives you a scale of complexity, essentially, and sophistication. And as you're starting to build these experiences and plan for what the student is going to be doing, doing or the learner is going to be doing, you can see that there's a range of them going from digital documents, and this is sort of the, the PDF version. It's the it's a Google Doc. It's a bit it's a bit of text. It's a bit of information. It doesn't do anything. Moving up to single loop animations, and this is really sort of your your PowerPoint or your your slide deck that does some very simple animation sorts of things, um, and then moving up into video. And what you're what you're seeing as you move up the scale is is that the learner is engaged at different at different levels, and so they start to 
start to experience things and have voice and choice in a different way than, than they would in the previous um, steps. And so, for example, video allows a teacher or, or a, a learning designer to, to give control to the learner for moving forward and back. They can fast forward, they can rewind, they can stop, they can pause, um, they can replay at another time. And, and that really helps them to start owning the learning. And then you move up into things like collections and, and uh, feedback loops and coding. And, and so these are uh, this feedback and coding loops. These are all sort of the amateur level of coding um, operations where, where it isn't going to be courseware. Um, however, it is going to be something that, that, the, that the teacher or the, the learning designer might be actually creating. So it might be a web page. It might be uh, something in WordPress, something like that, that's, that's uh, sort of the, the low level of, of coding uh, sophistication. But as you move up, the, the amount of, of planning time versus automating, automated learning flips right around that, that collections and video spot. And so that's an interesting intersection because that's where all of a sudden the learners have some control, right? They have more control over how they navigate their learning experience than they would down here at the, at the digital document level. And, and that's significant because if we are, are moving toward this um, more personalized model uh, that's leveraging the technology, that's bringing in some ideas around logistics and, and how learners move around the learning experience, then this is a critical juncture because we should be designing with more of these types of objects. If we're designing with the low end, it's just not going to get there. So at the very top of this, you can see courseware. And this was mentioned in the last, the last session. And, and this is really the highly, um, highly designed and professionally designed um, experiences. And they're immersive. And, and they have multiple modules. They, they are a world. And and the learner can navigate through that that experience um, effectively and and be um, and get to where they need to go. So so I give you that as sort of a backdrop. Um, we're gonna we're gonna jump to the next uh, scale, which was developed by the by the Learning Council. It's not brand new, but this is sort of some background and some context. This is really designed to to help folks understand what the um, what the the how to evaluate those those objects and really how do you how do you start to um, to know what are good or 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 effective or less effective objects and so what you can see here is there's two different there's two different um, areas of that scale um, the one at the top and the and the one at the bottom really describe sort of granularity scales and and so as you're evaluating what tools you use we talked about briefly there it, there was mention of of lexia and there's mention of a, of a couple of other types of of resources that that really um sort of follow this which is fantastic because at the concept level you might imagine that this is just uh, discrete bits of of information and they don't really live in context with anything else and and so so they then in turn are not very interactive sort of like we looked at the last scale and, and they don't do anything. So you, you move up that sophistication scale up to contextualized bits and pieces up into courses and eBooks. And these are all aggregated sorts of uh, curated types of information. And, and those are all things that are amateur authorware based. Um, what you might also see is that, that uh, um, this is, these are things, eBooks, for example, are things that teachers can create um, and, and that's, that's relatively easy. You know, it's portable. It does a fairly good job of, of helping people get information. Um, on the other end of that is, is sort of a similar scale, but this is really the professionally coded types of resources. And we go from an applet or an app, which is discrete in its function. It doesn't really connect to any other systems. It sort of does its thing and that's it. Um, it might do it really, really well. And we've seen a lot of those out there. Um, and yet, it, it doesn't connect. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually create an active experience that's connected to other things. And, and that's critical as we start moving forward in, in how, we, how we design experiences. Um, and then you move up into courseware um, and courses where, where again, we're starting to, to tip over into some VR and we're starting to leverage things like AI and, and the machine is, is beginning to take feedback and input, input from the learner and doing something with it and helping to, to move the learner in a certain direction. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a critical thing to understand as you're selecting tools to build into your ecosystem. And uh, you know, we talk about the, the learning management systems, we talk about sort of uh, curated collections and, and tools that, 
that give you lots of options in terms of information. And, and so it's un- important to understand where those things live and how they, how they can move. Um, whoops. Um, I, I think that, that, uh, that as we move through the contextualization of this, this is an important, um, an important document for us to take a look at, because as we think about all of the things that now exist within our, our ecosystem, and what are we using and what are we not using and what's good and what's valuable and what's creating a, a great and, and a valued experience for the learner, this is sort of where, where all of those things are, are graphically represented. And so what you can see here is that there's, there's a number of sort of software and, and technology types of, of, um, of considerations. And, and for example, the, the rostering, if we're, if we're talking about uh, single sign-on, any of that, that sort of back-end sort of stuff that helps facilitate a positive experience, that's all something to consider. But then also there's software systems. And this is all of your your SIS, all of your, your testing things, all of your, your courseware, your suites, all of the, the mail, all of those other tools that are actually part of building the experience that really should be considered and, and actually thought through very carefully um, internally. Because um, as soon as you start to unleash this kind of power onto a system, it can be overwhelming. And it is for others. In fact, uh, this little scaled graphic down here, the, the, uh, the by grade level, third up to seventh, this really sort of represents very simplistically kind of what's going on and what has been going on for, for many years as we've gotten to the point where we are today. And, and what you see is that by grade level, things are changing and shifting and, and that, creates, that creates a load, right? It's a digital load that we created that, that is, is now not helping this sense of being overwhelmed. And, you know, I have, I have, uh, uh, very frequent conversations with, with colleagues who are still in the classroom. And, and it's hard for them to articulate how or when this happened, but it's being felt and it's a real thing. Um, when I was in the classroom, I felt it as well. We were sort of in the beginning of this, of this shift and, and the transformation. And, and it's real. And this sort of describes it. This was kind of the first time that somebody came out and said, hey, guess what, folks? Uh, we just loaded a whole bunch of stuff onto, onto school systems, unwittingly perhaps, but there it is. And now what should we do with it? We really need a way to, to help move through all of the great resources that we just added, um, help people to, to sort of conceptualize what does, the, what does the planning look like for that? How does the, what's the implementation side of that? And how do we actually move to something that is much more design based and, and designed, uh, designed around the learner? So we're, we're, we're designing learning experiences. We're not planning for teaching. Uh, those are two very separate things, and we have to make sure that we that we can get to those things um, effectively. So, so what comes from that though is some discussion about well, how do we? What sort of a model could we use for this? And and what what in fact is missing in terms of of how we how we use all of that stuff and how we leverage the the tools that we have? And and what was discovered when this was developed was that was that the logistics that Lonnie was mentioning the logistics. Um, component was missing. There wasn't really anything that said, "All right, here's how you how you move through these things. Here, how, here's how you, uh, as a learner, can can get out into your learning experience and when you need to have certain things, because that's all part of beyond digital literacy, right? That's part of being able to leverage the the tools that you have as a learner and know when you should be using one versus another and which one is effective for you and which one isn't and which one uh, where you need to go in order to get additional information or help." And, and those are all um, in this thing, right? They're all in the, in the bucket and, and in the sort of the, 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 uh, the matrix of, of what we're now um, proposing um, for, for what this design might look like. So it's, it's critical that we understand and acknowledge that, that we have had that, that uh, opportunity for us. Um, another thing that I want to, that I want to throw at you, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the dictionary, the, this is, is not brand new. It's been, it's been around for many years and, and it's being developed by the Edge of Jedi in, in conjunction with a lot of other, um, a lot of other colleagues in the system. And, and it really is the best thinking right now. And, and I, I appreciate this not only because I'm connected with the organization, but as a practitioner and as a, as a teacher and as a principal and as a chief academic officer, um, it really does help me. This is something that I wish that I would have had many years ago. It does a great job 
of helping to define terminology and create common language and vocabulary. And we know that, that in the process of changing, that that is a critical component that we all have to be speaking the same speak. And, and so I'll just go through some of the, some of the examples here. This is available online and there's gonna be a link in, this, in the slide deck for all of the stuff that, you, that we're gonna be looking at today. And I, I very highly recommend that you grab this and take a look at it. Um, when you are sitting down at the table with your, with your compatriot, if you're a te teaching and learning person, and you sit down with your, with your compatriot on the technology side or information technology side, and, and you say, okay, here's the thing we're doing. This is a great middle ground. This is this allows that conversation to to be understood. Um, if Dr. Burks, if you're on the on the line, I need to give you a shout out because you sound like a like a teaching and learning person, and perhaps that's your background. But what I love about it was that that was seamless. It was seamless, um, and, and that's fantastic. Um, this dictionary can help folks get there if you aren't aren't already there. So anyway, categories there they are. There's nine of them. Um, you can see what they are. Um, each of those categories digs in a little bit deeper on, on what those things are and, and gives you sort of a sense of, of what to expect within each category. I'll share some examples very briefly. Um, these, are all, these are all some of those vocabulary points and, and characteristics of resources that, that need to be understood. And they need to be understood because they do certain things and cause learning experiences to, to, be, um, to be experienced in, in certain ways. And some of those are positive and some of those are negative. And so you wanna make sure that you're using um, uh, resources that have, that have positive aspects and characteristics. So gating is, a, is one of those things that pops up, right? It's, it's, a, it's a gaming function essentially. And, and yet in terms of, of creating an experience and allowing learners to have choice and voice and modulate within the experience, uh, move faster, slower. This is one of those things that you want to understand because if you're gating kids, um, unnecessarily, then you're really holding them back from create from experiencing something that would be personalized, and and then we're we're back 15 years to where where it might be everyone sitting in a classroom in rows moving at the same pace, and that's ridiculous, right? Um, we don't want to do that, and so understanding how gating works is one of those important things, not only for the resource, but but just in how you're designing the learning, right? How are you going to ungate your experience for kids? How are you going to do that? And and that's a that's it's it it's not easy, right? It's not easy, but it's something that you have to think about and, and the resources can help you do that. Um, hostile characteristics, another great one. Uh, those are things that pop up that, that uh, you probably didn't expect. And, and so um, these are all, all the other examples and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on these, but, but this is an example of, of what you can expect in the dictionary. It really does a, a fine job of, of making sure that you can understand that. So. I'm going to pause for a breath there before I jump into standards for administrators, teachers, and learners briefly before we get into some other design frameworks and architecture um, to sort of toss out a, a, a request for questions and, and or thoughts as we just sort of went uh, lickety split through the, through the context of that. So now is a great time to, to raise your digital hand. Lonnie, I know you're looking for hands, so please interrupt um, and, and uh, we'll bring those voices forward. Cool. I'm going to move on, folks, uh, because I know that we're we're uh, we're short of time today a little bit. Um, so, as we consider now that context, right? So that's the background of how did we get to where we are in our current understanding, and and now how do we what do we do with that um, relative, especially to creating a new architecture and creating um, a design framework for designing learning experiences, and then also establishing. Um, responsibilities and roles that might be changing and shifting. Um, the, the Learning Council and the Edu Jedi developed some standards for, for various roles within the system. And, and so those standards are, are really helping to define what your job and scope is now. And, and I wanna point out, for example, administrators, and I'm gonna highlight this for a moment. As an administrator, your job is changing. And we, those of us who have been in administration, who have been a principal, um, have been a central office administrator, you know that, that there are many plates up and you're juggling all of them and you're making decisions and you're really moving, uh, helping to move the system forward. But um, you may not always be thinking about uh, professional responsibilities that relate to software, for example. 
And, and if you're a chief academic officer and you don't understand that part of your responsibility is actually reading every one of those contracts for the resources that your, that your CNI department or you are recommending for use, then, then you've, you'd sidestep some things. Now, you absolutely have to understand those, and, and it's part of your responsibility. It's part of your responsibility to know um, things like single sign-on, right? If you're a teaching and learning person, you really have to know that stuff. And if you're, a, if you're the information tech person, um, you really need to start thinking about, about um, uh, how, what the learning aspects or what the lesson-giving aspects of resources are, because that's all really very important. And, and as I mentioned before, all of us should be speaking the same language. Um, these standards that you'll find in the dictionary um, really do a good job of, of beginning to outline that. And, and I would recommend, um, as many executive teams have, start there and just start digging into it as, as a learner. And it isn't, it isn't, oh my gosh, another standard set. This is actually great guidance for, for all of us as we help this thing to move forward. And, and so administrators, for sure, um, take a look at it. Principals, you've got some responsibilities um, within that digital resource realm. You, you absolutely have some responsibilities. Can't be, can't be tossed off to, to, the, uh, to the lawyers and things. So this is, this is a sort of a, a brief um, uh, couple of examples from those standards. So the, the one that I want to highlight is, is actually this one. It's actually working progressively toward full individualization and or student ability to personalize. So that's critical, right? Because we're all moving in that direction and that's where we have to go. Um, and if your organization isn't actually working toward that, now's the time, now's the time. Let's draw the line in the sand. Let's say, we, we gotta go do that. If the next time you're reviewing your strategic plan or if you don't have a strategic plan and you're getting one, add that vocabulary in there because that has to happen. If, if you're not, then, then you're holding kids back and we don't do that. Um, we don't hold kids back and, um, and simply because we hadn't thought about something. Um, another great one, working toward increasing digital pathways, right? This is, this is just what we've been talking about. It's, it's all of those pathways and, and course building workflow, the workflow and the logistics, uh, that, lo that language is coming back in. And, and this is a great place to, to help to understand that, all of that. Uh, teachers have a very similar type of a standard set, and this is really um, how, how teachers are, are using, um, using systems and composing within systems and how they're, how they're conceptualizing the learning design and the student experience, right? It obviously includes student oversight, but, but really now, how am I designing with these, with these tools in a similar way that if it was a, if it was a, a physical book adoption, um, districts are adopting the digital resources, right? And so it's on a subscription basis or it's on a whatever basis. And, and yet these are the tools that we then will use to create an experience. And, and it isn't page by page. It, it just isn't. And, and you, can't, you can't just do that. You can't hold the teacher guide in your hand and, and turn to page five and kids, this is where we're going to go. It isn't that. You have to design an experience mindful of, of how you're going to compose in that, in that ecosystem with these other tools and platforms. And, and what is the end user going to be experiencing on that? And what is their experience going to be with that digital content or non-digital content, right? I mean, if you're, if you're mixing that, then, then more power to you. You know how to use, how and when to use technology for greatest effect. That's, that's really pretty critical. Um, so the students, whoops, students, similar type of a, type of a standard set. And, and this is really, um, how, do I, how do I understand my own role in moving my own learning? And, and how do I know which, like I mentioned before, how do I know which resources are the most effective for me? How do I know which structures are going to give me the most leverage? How, where do I go for help? Is that gonna be digital? Is it gonna be a human? And, and how do I modulate that? That's a responsibility set. And those, those student standards, those are behavioral and, and those don't come naturally. That's not something that, that is just going to happen. You have to teach those. And, and so the recommendation for sure is take those standard sets, Dig them, dig into those, and start start taking it apart and applying it to your own to your own context. Um, fully knowing, obviously, that we're that we're moving um, forward with these and evolving them as we go, um, with the help of of all of you out there in the in the ed world, um, in on in the classrooms and and on the ground in the buildings, um, helping us to evolve this so that it's actually a tool that some some of you 
uh, that everyone can use um, to help move the experience forward. So, um, so I'm going to switch gears now. We've we've had some context. We understand now sort of where the thinking came uh, came from, um, how we can start to look at and, and identify different types of learning objects. We can um, we have a scale for how to evaluate those objects in terms of complexity and granularity. And we have a dictionary that gives us gives us common vocabulary. Um, we have some standards that describe uh, roles and responsibilities and, and what my job should look like as I start to design. And now we're going to take a look at at the at this model of, of learning design. And I want to spend uh, a fair good, fairly good amount of time um, sort of digging into this and hopefully getting some feedback from some folks because because this is actually relatively critical in terms of how you move forward in this in this hybrid architecture for personalized learning and and what you do in terms of, of creating positive experiences and rich experiences um, for learners. And those could be teachers and right adult learners and and young people um, by the same token. So so what you're looking at here is is two different models. And the Edu Jedi have been working on a model that would describe and help people to, to leverage the things that we're talking about, to leverage the technology, to leverage the, the, the structures that exist now um, in terms of, of how we personalize an experience. And, and so, so what came out of that was, was sort of a comparison, right? We always take a look through at the models. There's, there's any number of them, they're all valid. Um, and what we're, what we're comparing to here is, is the Addy's model. And, and so you see the Addy's model um, at the top, and it's it's really um, you know it's really relatively relatively linear, and and so you see that it's that it's broken into a few different sections, right? There's there's sort of the analysis, there's the the development of the of the lesson, there's the design of the lesson, there's implementation of the lesson, and you evaluate the lesson and and the the learning, and and so so that does a good job of of describing. Uh, what the teacher act, uh, activity should be, and and how you might go about designing a lesson. Um, however, it doesn't do a really good job of of articulating um, some learner centricity and and sort of the acknowledgement that time, space, and place are now something that we can use and mold with. It's like Legos, right? And so this sort of dumps the Legos out onto the table. And, and then rebuilds them in a way that is much more flexible and, and really starts to attach itself to how you might go about designing for, for the experiences. So, so the, I'll go over some of these sections and then I'll discuss sort of some of the differences. So, so what we're talking about now versus teacher uh, being the, the sole column or the, the row there, what we're talking about is school and teacher being on one column. And then teacher and student being on another one, except that those two are labeled in a, in a very particular way, right? So what we're talking about here in that top row is, is workflow logistics design. And, and this, uh, I know Lonnie keeps mentioning Uber, and, and this is actually right on, right? Because, because what we're talking about is, is workflow describes the, the activity of the learner and how the learner is navigating through things and, and around learning and how how the learner and the and the leader or the facilitator of that learning are are interacting and where they interact and and that's important because as, as you're you couldn't take a, a more traditionally planned lesson like we see at the top and then add those components it, it would be clumsy and and it probably wouldn't work and so if you're if you're simply modifying the things that already exist and not being cognizant of workflow and logistics then it's going to be clumsy. And what happens when we have a clumsy experience is that the learners aren't engaged and, and that's, that, never, that never works. So you'll see at the top, um, the, the workflow logistics design row is broken out into scope. It's broken out into mapping design, implementation, uh, intersection and logistics are sort of lumped into one and then termination or continuance. And that's a, that's a yes, it's going to terminate or we're going to continue with the experience. And so so there are some, some brief definitions there that we'll go into a little bit in just a moment. But, but the scope and, and setting goals is really um, relative to, um, to selecting the standards. How do, I, how do I connect my experience to standards? Which ones am I, am I choosing to wrap into this bundle? 
um, versus going discreetly because that's not that's not ever how we plan our learning experiences. It has to be integrated, and and so that that really moves into mapping or or how how the ideas are curated, right? How do we start to to um, to onboard um, the appropriate level of of information and, and ideas, and and so what does that look like? That's sort of the when we talked about about logistics or workflow in my mind as an instructor, then I'm thinking through, okay, how are they going to move through this? And and relative to our definitions, where if I'm gating, where am I? Where and why am I gating? Or am I simply ungating most of them or the, the majority of them so that learners can move forward at their own pace? Um, and then there's design, right? And this is this is the area where you select certain tools, right? Tools and assessments and, and activities and things that you can use, Lego blocks that you're using to to uh, to build the the experience. And and that is a little bit different, right? That's a little bit different than the design up above in in Addy's model, right? That's where where they're talking about a deep dive into into the the course or the training structure. What we're talking about is much more organic, right? It's it's moving around. It it feels like you have some control as the learner. And, and that's really, that's where we're going, right? Um, over to implementation, and this is really how do we sequence or, or code the lesson, right? How do, we, how do we sequence those bits and pieces that we then mapped and then designed with? And, and how does that actually go? And this is, this is me um, pushing the go button and, and really helping, uh, helping to think about, all right, what, what is it gonna look like when I, when I set them free into the wild, what is that gonna look like? Um, the intersection and logistics um, uh, box is really talking about um, tagging the sequence for those intersections, and and by that um, I mean um, how do I how do I flag certain points within the experience um, within the context of certain tools so that so that an intersection is indicated, and it might be an intersection with peers, it might be an intersection with teacher. Uh, it might be an intersection with additional resources and that it might be digital or non-digital. And how do I, in the grand plan, when I hit play, how are those flags going to pop up, indicate to the learner that they need to go over to, to room five and meet with, a, with a, a cohort of peers and a learning facilitator? How would they know that? What would be the flag for that? And how do I, how do I make that explicit and, 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 uh, designed um, in a sophisticated manner so that it's not a clumsy uh, sort of a clumsy activity. And then um, finally, am I, am I going to be done? Is this is once the learner reaches sort of the ending point of this, of this experience, are we finished at that point and are they going to something else or, or is there a continuance? Are they, are they going to simply take, take that experience and build upon it and continue to, to dig for uh, a little bit deeper or go further within a concept? So that's sort of the workflow logistics design consideration. Um, the, the discovery design, which is sort of a teacher slash student uh, uh, category, this is really um, under scope. What we're really talking about is the teacher and the user uh, or the learner are, are co-designing this, right? And so what we, what we know is that, that high level questioning really helps to cement learning. We know that that, 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 that inquiry base really does a good job of helping to engage students. Um, it helps them to move further into the learning. And, and this discovery di design speaks directly to that, right? So how are we within that set of standards that we identified up at the top? How are we helping to create inquiry points so that, so that we have some curiosity and we're starting to, start, starting to go look for information? Um, over to the, the mapping section of, the same, of that same row, which is really where where we're talking about again, learners um, discovering where they where their their best resources are and where the 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 best information is, and and that has to be designed explicitly, right? That doesn't happen by accident. Um, they're actually they're actually using that inquiry um, base from the scope side, and now now helping to to map that that uh, learner into those resources. That's that's what we're talking about there and, and helping them to get there through that questioning. Um, the design is really our user thesis, or this is how, how are you going to show what you know, right? And, and how do we create within this larger experience, um, how do we create those points where you'll show what you know? And right, we use them all the, all the time in the classroom. 
their exit tickets, their, their our formative assessments, they might be digital in that similar form. Um, there are little pausing points where, where you're, you're given the opportunity to show what you know in your design. What is that going to look like, right? Is it, is it going to be um, something hands-on and tactile? Are they going to be building something? Um, what are all those considerations within your design of the experience? Um, implementation of that, right, is thesis and proof refinement. So once we, once we have a question and we're starting to, to, create, um, to create proof of, of learning, um, then how do we refine that, right? And how do we, how do we in, um, help to encourage revisions and, and help to use some of those iterative thinking types of, of skills? Because that's really where, where we're going to start to see improvement um, as soon as they're starting to, to evaluate and, um, and assess their own learning. Then, then we know that we're, we're going to have a stronger outcome. Um, and then over to, to the intersection and logistics end, um, where we're talking about discovery design, this is really the the uh, the interaction uh, between the teacher and the and or a tutor or a facilitator and the student and and so which ones of those are needed and this is sort of the where the learner might be selecting one versus the other and that's that's voice and choice right they might go to one place versus another um, it might be sort of like YouTube right how many how many different people can you go to that are going to teach you about the Pythagorean theorem. Um, there's a ton and one of them is going to work better for you than the other. So, so this is really the, the model and, and very simplistically as we, as it breaks down, um, the, the sort of, um, an example of what that might look like, um, would be something like this. And so, um, for you on the screen, it's going to be fairly tiny, but, but what you might imagine is that, that this is a math experience that's being designed right? They're, they're, the, the facilitator is moving through all of those steps. And, and of course, we know that it's not linear. Um, you're going to be considering all of these things simultaneously. Um, however, um, in scope, again, you're looking for pacing guides, you're looking for standard sets, you're, you're figuring out what does this, the learner need to know and be able to do. And, and that's the basis, right? That's the thing that I, that I know I'm going to base my assessments on. I'm going to build my experience around this thing. Um, over to the idea curation and mapping sort of a section where, where you're, you're, you're understanding the logistics of where your learners are at any given point. So in this example, it's 50% of the kids are remote, right? So now what are you going to do? Now you've designed this experience. And, and if, and I've been there myself as a, as a staff developer, I've, I've, I've designed an experience for in-person, but when I had to shift to virtual or hybrid virtual, um, some of those strategies broke down and, and I, or I had to rethink them and reframe some of the things that I thought were so easy and engaging in an in-person type of a staff development environment. And, and so I actually had to go through this very same thing with adult learning and start to think about, gosh, now what do I do? Yeah, we've got breakout rooms in our Zoom, but, but what? And, and so this is that, right? You, you're, you're designing an experience and you have to be cognizant of where your learners are and how they're going to be moving. And are they even, are they even attending um, emotionally and intellectually in the thing that you, that you're setting up and how do you, en how do you engage that? Right. We all, we all hear about, about tales of woe um, from folks who have designed an experience that on paper sounds great and probably is great, but then, but then how do they get those learners engaged? Well, uh, that's tough, right? That's a, that's a tough one. As tough as it is in the classroom, um, it's, also, um, it's also a challenge when you, when you have 50% of your kids being, being remote. So um, design in this example is, is looking at the courseware, um, selecting modules, and, and then sequencing them, those and thinking through your mapping uh, plan. Um, how are you going to sequence those so that students can, can self-navigate? and not have to wait, right? You don't want kids waiting for other kids. Um, we don't want kids waiting for the teacher to hit a magic button that allows them to go into the next thing. Uh, that would be a great example of gating um, and unnecessary gating. Um, we've all been in classrooms where, where kids are sitting in their chair um, in the old days, right? Um, waiting for, for the rest of the class to catch up and here they've finished their stuff in 15 minutes. Um, that's, that's ridiculous. So um, think about that. How are you? How are you ungating and how are you sequencing for for self navigation? Um, in this one, the the implementation set is is really um, 
is really setting steps, right? And so you're thinking about login, you're thinking about modules and how they're going to get into those. And as they get into them, where else are they going to be going? Um, are they going to be going to, to some additional resources that are within the ecosystem? And, and do those connect, um, are those integrated with the courseware or are they outside of the courseware? And if they're outside of the courseware, how do they get there and then get back if that's what your design is? And that's all something that, that has to be considered in this. Um, this, this example has a hands-on project, for example, and that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely a departure from, I'm gonna go from digital more than likely to something hands-on and physical outside of my, my device which is fantastic, right? Um, but how are you gonna do that? What, what is that gonna look like? And, and how, what if you lose kids in that, in that, little, that little transition? Um, how will you bring them back? Um, the, the intersection of logistics now, now that you've created that, 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 that step-by-step -step sort of the idea of where the learner is going to go and how they'll move within that experience. So then, so then you're, you're now looking for live teaching moments. So where, if they're in this digital uh, hybrid world, where are the where are the intersections where where I want me as the teacher to to be checking in with them? And we've done this in the past. If if you've ever done um, any of the the small groups and and you've taught elementary school, right? You've got you've got a bunch of different groups and and everybody's on their own on their own path and and most of them are self directed and and you still have a responsibility to meet with thirty one kids, right? And so. In this same in this same instance, we're not suggesting that you, that the teacher is not in this because the teacher is the most critical component in the experience. And and so, where are you going to put those though? Right? It's not going to be a lecture any longer. Um, you also can't just let them go and be feral. Uh, there has to be some 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 interaction. Those intersections have to be planned. And and so, what you see here is things like video conferencing. You could use a platform. You could use uh, you can use physical meeting locations within the school that might not even be in the same classroom. It might not even be you. It might be might be a teacher in another grade level. It might be somebody else in the building that is that is conferring with these students and and helping them to deepen their understanding. Um, and then and then thinking about continuation, right? So kids that made it through all the steps, you might terminate the lesson, trigger a badge or a, or a mark of some kind, uh, some sort of a, an indication that they they've reached some proficiency, um, set them free onto the next thing. You might have some students not making it quite that far um, through their assessment, uh, be redirected back into um, sort of a continuation of that experience or a deepening of that, or, or it might look like, like an, an intervention type of a track. And, and so all of that then creates this larger experience. And, and so having this, this model can help to, to move your, your learning experiences into this sort of a, sort of a realm. So, um, so that's an important piece to, to, to consider. Um, I'm going to pause there because I'd love to get some feedback from folks on, on where that sits within the realm of, of, um, of sort of what you know and what, what your experience has been and where, where your system is currently. Okay, Chris, uh, yep. this is Leilani. I'm going to get back on now. And um, just be part of this whole conversation so I can share a little bit of an update too. Yeah. Check in chat. Um, hi, Ellen. I, I know you're going to be next up. Uh, Ellen, if you want to comment on all of this work, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it. Um, and then I can give a little bit of an update too. <clears throat> Got to find Ellen and unmute her. Uh, Doug, if you can help me out with that, that'd be awesome. Hi, good afternoon. You know, as I as I listen to Chris talk, you know, when when I see the edu EduData emails come out, um, and I know I took the pledge, a lot of times I don't always get to get into the nitty gritty of it, I kind of skip through. And so getting the opportunity to listen to Chris and the explanation of everything. Um, I guess it for me, it's reconfirming that the work that we have been doing in our ed tech department is on the right track. Like, um, you know, we might not use the exact same terminology, but we are doing this work and we have been for five years now. And so I think if we, if we continue to help ensure that all teachers are equipped, I, I think right now where we're at is we're seeing pockets of excellence throughout the district. 
And so it's getting all teachers equipped to reframe their thinking and say, I don't lesson plan, I design learning experiences. And I don't plan based on the curriculum, but I plan based on student needs. Hmm. And, and, and so we've been working on making that mindset shift. So just listening to him talk, I'm thinking like, okay, yes, we have moved to, you know, workflow and logistics and discovering design. And we, we are teaching teachers how to design these learning experiences where they're putting those interactions in and, and how to leverage tools. And I'm happy to say, Chris, that we're not just saying tools are tech, that, you know, a thinking map is a tool, right? And so, um, yeah, it, it, it reconfirmed for me, like, okay, well, yeah, we just need to stay the course and go deeper and deeper and, and uh, with all of the teachers. So mm. with that, I, that's, that's fantastic, Ellen. And I really appreciate you hopping in and, and reaffirming that, that this is actually reality for you. Um, what I'm, what I'm curious about as, as I talk with other, other organizations like yours, um, and, and other colleagues in the business, the, the one question that I, that I often, um, pose is how is, how is this understood at the higher levels of, of the executive leadership within the district? Because, mm -hmm. um, often, um, when you talk about training the teachers and creating these experiences, what we sometimes miss is how do we how do we create adult learning that goes from the top all the way down to the classroom, um, but vary that learning so that so that your executive group is is also learning how how these personalized experiences should occur, and then and then more importantly, how do how does a person in my position support somebody in the classroom? Because ultimately, your job is to support teaching and learning. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter where you are in the organization, you have to start to understand that. And so, so I'm curious to know, even from, from, from your experience, um, where is the top, where is the executive level within that learning? Um, I know for our organization, uh, getting the opportunity to move on to the leadership team during the pandemic and now staying on, I, I think that they're, they're still in their beginning phases of learning because their role within our organization is different and they have to rely on us and trust that we're going to steer the ship in the right direction. So I know oftentimes our assistant superintendent, she'll say, I know a little bit about a lot. I rely on you to, to lead a tech and trust that you're, the work that you're doing, uh, the work that you're doing is, is going to have an impact. Of course, she's, they're giving very clear vision. I would say that during the pandemic, the collaboration that started to happen amongst like ed services leadership um, and, and other divisions uh, has been amazing because I think that the vision is, um, the vision now, I think leadership now sees that we, and I see it as a silver lining, silver lining of the pandemic, how important uh, leveraging technology is within all our work. And that it's not just, okay, ed tech does tech, but no, my work needs technology. And maybe it's just to make my life as a staff member more efficient, <laughs> right? But um, getting administrators at the district level to see that leveraging technology really helps to elevate that teaching strategy. And now the students are impacted greater and their acad academic achievement can be greater because the right strategy was paired with the right tool and it elevated that learning for, for that student. Mm -hmm. And so I think they have that vision now much greater than they had prior to the pandemic. So that's kind of a silver lining for me. <laughs> for sure, yeah, no, absolutely. And, if, and of course they're lucky to have you um, advocating and leading that work mm -hmm. because, because without, that, without the advocate and the person who is pushing, then that doesn't happen. 
and and that's where things start to fall apart and slow down. So uh, kudos, big kudos to you for leading the work in your district for sure. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Ellen. And we're gonna like turn turn on your camera in just a little bit here, so for a full sharing moment. Um, okay, so I want to give a little update and uh, have interaction with you for a second here, Chris, about <clears throat> really what's going on with the all of this Edu Jedi work right now because I think people need to know there's been some what forty five or more superintendents and directors of curriculum instruction nationwide get involved in the last what seventeen. I think maybe 20 meetings so far that we've had on it. And they were all about these things in the Edu Jedi dictionary, you know, learning design for administrators, teachers, learners, user interface, and then also the dictionary trend. So, so a couple of the new things that came out, I'd like you to comment on is that in the early meetings, we were talking about tagging one of the definitions of terms. And so people started talking about like, you know, that's one of the messiest areas. So if you have a learning management systems and you got all these different teachers throwing stuff in there and folders and all over here, um, there is no tagging rubric, like a normalcy um, that most schools might adopt and have all the teachers follow it for tagging resources, you know, all the way down to the document and the folder level. And in the absence of that, you're losing time or a teacher is doing a new open internet search after being feeling like they couldn't find what they wanted within the closed walled garden search because people have tagged it all, you know, diff thousand different ways. So for example, you know, always start with subject and subjects are predefined list, math, science, language, grade, and then, you know, other sorts of, of rubric, like how you would label something and then how you would start a description. So what are your thoughts about that? Just be, being, having been in a school and filing all your own stuff. We talked about nesting at one point and, and that's a, that's a, a really interesting thing. And, and what I've, what I've experienced, unfortunately, is, is probably the other side of that, where, where you have a whole bunch of, you've got a sea of information, right? And it can, it can be daunting, even your Google drive, right? If you've got a Google drive and you haven't adopted a naming convention, um, good luck finding something. And, and so, for example, if it's, if it's resources and, and you, you know, what we, what we normally see is that, that you'll find some that you use most often. You remember where those are and how to use them. Um, they might not be the best, but you're comfortable with them. And so the chances of you stepping outside of that and using something else that might be way more effective or might, or might allow you to be more effective um, those chances diminish because you can't find it. So you see resources like, um, uh, like any of the any of the sort of the dashboard types of resources, and and you you can see that they're putting together dashboards of information of resources um, within uh, within the ecosystem for the school. And so all of the apps that you might use as a fifth grader, they're all there. It's awesome. It's single sign on, and and there they are. Um, as a teacher. Uh, it's a little bit different because you're you you can see all of them. You may not be adept or or you might not have proficiency with all of the resources, but but they're there. And so so what happens is that we we bump into sort of an adult learning um, challenge where we have all of these things. All of them are ostensibly good. Um, how am I ever going to have the ability to teach adults how to use them efficiently in the system? And, and what, it, what is that going to look like? Now that I have a different structure for adult learning, what is it going to look like? And, and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a really tough one. I mean, that's really hard to, to know. How do, you, how do you teach folks about all these things? And, and then more importantly, how do you start winnowing down the number of resources that are out there in the universe um, for folks to, to design with and not overwhelm them with a sea of stuff that they can't, they're never going to ever use all, all of it? And, and then start identifying which ones are, are most effective and use those. So that's, yeah. that's, a, and that's I, a challenge. And I, I think what you were sharing earlier, the work from, from earlier reports, this digital learning object scale yep. and, this, and this one, yep. you know, what takes more work, what, you know, more instructional planning versus more automated learning. This is a epiphany for most school districts. For sure. They're not thinking of it this way at yep. all about the workload. But more importantly, when we get into tagging, which is going to be a, a part of the new dictionary now, obviously, because 
we had that heated conversation about it in one of the Edge of Jedi meetings. Um, how you would tag is probably going to come out of this work, you know, because it's either an amateur bits and piece of something scanned in or a video a teacher made or um, it's, it's piecemeal, barely contextualized. Contextualization can be as much as just the tag stuck on it, mm-hmm. um, but the tagging needs a standard. There, right. there has to be tagging standards, and those are missing in almost every school district I've ever talked to. I think one was like, no, you got to label it with the subject first. That's it. Um, and then the professional grade stuff, right? So, right. so I think this is going to be a major part of it. We're going to go back and uh, give the draft back out to the Edu Jedi. The other yeah. thing that happened in the meeting so far is that uh, Superintendent Phil Jankowski and, and Superintendent uh, Shawan Reberry they both wanted to talk a lot about big data because every school district in America is getting deluged with data now. Also, another superintendent this last week said, you know, we got a lot of data. We're not really sure how to use it all. So this data issue is matching the curve of sudden uh, everybody neck deep in, in using tech and a lot more software. And now they're getting pelted with data and data literacy is not high. So first, they're just learning how to use the machines and learning how to use different pieces of software. They're getting the PD, like you said, they need. And, and uh, like Poe was talking about, um, but then right behind that is this other new emerging need, which is data literacy. So for example, <clears throat> Sharon, uh, Superintendent Reberry said that they wanted to now take on going into 2022, a whole set of PD to teach teachers data inquiry, how to look at data and use data to actually personalize learning. So this is a sort of like the next level up. So we're going to be talking about that too. What are your comments on so, that? So I've got, all, I've got all kinds of thoughts on that. So, so when I was in the classroom, uh, we were sort of getting into PLC work, which was fantastic, right? And so there were the, there were the questions and you posed the questions and and so what we were what we were supposed to be doing was analyzing data, right? We we're supposed to be taking a look at information, and and then doing something with it, making some decisions, and 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 so this has been an ongoing challenge um, from from those those sort of original data wall days until now when we've got. I, I mean, I was talking to a colleague in another in another district, and and they had at least six resources that were providing information on one learner and all of that stuff was coming in at once. Right. And so, so and not it wasn't, connected, not and connected not, at all, not yeah. at all connected. Yeah. And so, so what, what this teacher was doing was saying, I don't even know what to look at, look at. And so I'm going to look at two because it's easiest and their dashboards work for me. And, and then we're going to do that. Right. And so, so it, it's, you know, this, this conversation about how do we, how do we get all of that stuff into one spot so that people can actually use it? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's huge, right? I mean, that's gigantic because mm-hmm. what the, the machine can actually start to pre-look at stuff. And, and so machines are way faster, right? I mean, Google knows what I'm drawing. Before I even finish a house in Google Draw, it knows that I'm drawing a house. All I have to do is put that little peak on the top of something and it goes house. And I'm like, of course it's a house. How did you know? It's because there's a sea of, right? There's a sea of information on on what a human will do when they're asked to draw a house and the machine just goes it's a house because 17 billion of you draw a house like that and so what i'm waiting for is is the machine to help us to do some of that stuff and right we're close we're pretty close there's some there's some resources out there that are that are approximating right and and so when we can get to the point where where the machine is helping us know right? This is going to be some of our AI discussion and helping us know what the learner is doing. Then we can start taking a load off because otherwise we're asking our teachers to be data scientists. And that's ridiculous. Um, we got it. We got to get to a point where the machines are helping us to, 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 to learn the learner because that's the number one job, right? To learn the learner. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so how do we do that? And how do we help the teachers through technology to get to that point where they can go, okay, yeah, now I understand. I can put that with what I know about the, the learner and what their what their context is, what their their social emotional um, sort of milieu might be, and I can I can merge those, and now I can go and and that's going to be the sort of the golden golden egg. 
Uh, yeah, but there's sure. actually more than that level that we talked about too. So you're talking about sort of the new integration standards. IMS Global has an integration standard for data, but not everybody, not all the software providers doing courseware that provide you their internalized dashboards for right. math practice work. They don't connect back to your LMS, so they don't share out the data, right? So that's why almost every principal and teachers that we talk to, they say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a dashboard checker now. It's half my job. And, and yeah, they're not really using it. But the other direction it's going to, and let me just grab something that show you really quick. If we play this game that actually is teaching at the teacher level a couple of years ago. And so this is something that the Learning Council has really had a lot of attention on. What are da data positive points and data error points? So this goes down into a data literacy that is individual even to the teacher. So for example, uh, students answering an altered sequence. So that's an error point. An altered sequence of understanding is a data error point. A omitted point, like you ask them to do an essay in, about the Civil War and they admit, oh, omit the dates, right? Like, so, okay, there's an omitted data point the student didn't grasp. They think this happened yesterday, it didn't. Um, or a missed conclusion is a data error point. Right, a missed step in a science experiment is a data error point. A positive error, error a, a positive data point is factual proof, uh, correct goal, uh, differences are actually different. The person's not equating the same thing to the same thing. So there's a lot of these data error points, data positive points, and that that's the basic data literacy that is missing before you can even get to the dashboard interpretation level. Mm -hmm. Because now when you're talking about individual student later, uh, student uh, per, uh, personalization, if you didn't understand it down here at the raw error point level, when you're looking at the dashboard, you may still not be able to unravel that student's problem with fractions. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. So that's what they, that's what we were talking about. So we realized that we're going to have to do a little bit more work at both ends on this whole big data thing that's going to happen because the Learning Council is now predicting that going into mid-2022, that's going to be the next biggest wave of concern for schools. Mm. Um, people wanting to go, you know, deep into the whole data literacy piece. For sure. And, you know, we used to do that in the old days with something called conferring. And, and it, and it took a while because you were, you were sitting down with the student and you were, you were identifying where those error points were and that helped you to make decisions moving forward. And, and, you know, at scale, how do you do that? That's, mm -hmm. that's the next body of work, right? That's the next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So then another thing that what happened is we had um, from Idaho, one of the state level security experts for the department of ed on in the Edu Jedi meetings. And he brought up some new definitions we're gonna be including in the security section on denial of service and particularly ransomware. And I don't wanna cite the numbers he was talking about, but ransomware attacks right now on schools and school districts are off the charts. They just like, during the pandemic, they just went nuclear. Yeah. And this is horrible for schools because it's a financial hit just to be able to get your data back. Otherwise you're just gonna kiss it away. And the liability aspects of data compromised of little kids. If that goes public, and in most states, it, it's forced to go public under law, you have to notify all those parents that their student's home address has been um, compromised, which is terrifying for parents. So this, so there's a couple of things that are gonna happen new in the dictionary around that. And then uh, new definitions on things like what is the definition of auto cohorting, what does hover over mean, and then a lot of really nice conversations about the uh, instructional design model that you shared. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was at the teacher level conversation, a lot of it was like uh, concern about um, teacher role, which is very common. Um, which stems often from a not understanding really what technology is supposed to do to do your work for you because you're standing there thinking as a teacher that it's taking away your job um, rather than, oh, good, this is going to do this for me. It's awesome, right? So there's a, there's a lot of leadership conversation that we had to have around that. Like 
more leaders need to be actually leading teachers to understand that technology is surrounding and uh, uplifting their teacherness to be a very refined, able to personalize, able to have more time with my individual students to help them. That's what it's supposed to be doing. If it's not doing that, and you're running around doing too much email back and forth and the back and forth and the data checking and all is too much. It's because maybe it's not done right. Right. Totally. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can go back to, I can go back to my, my early days in the classroom. And, and if I was working my butt off in, within the context of an experience, it meant that I wasn't planned well. I just designed it poorly because then I'm doing more work. If I'm doing all the work, the kids aren't learning and, and that's ridiculous. It, it's, it's nuts. No, I, I, that for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, really big issues, but what it feels like from all the edu Jedi conversations that we've been having, as we go deep into this minutia of what is digital learning experience? Um, what are the roles of the humans? What is the data doing? How is the model shifting? It's very real um, and I think Poe earlier this morning talked about this a lot and can't wait to hear more from Ellen. It's very real that the transition just went, you know, 10 steps forward out of 10. <laughs> and, and maybe there's 11 and 12 coming up, but uh, it's very uh, seriously real that everyone is uh, drowning in the complexity of all this and still looking for a little bit more of a magic bullet. This is hard. Like this slide that you showed about the model, there is no other market that has this level of complexity. None. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's it. And that's, I, I'm glad that you say it's hard work. So I, when I was, when I was working with the, with a couple of teams of administrators, you're right. The silver bullet is, is something that everybody hopes that that is going to be included. Um, but, but just acknowledging that, that this is going to be really hard and just saying it's going to be hard and your brain's going to hurt and your brain's going to grow um, and, and you're going to go home exhausted at the end of the day. It's going to be that way. Let's acknowledge that it will be hard work and, and yet it's going to be meaningful work and it's going to be valuable work. And at the other, on the other side of it, our brains are bigger and we've, and we've created something that has some sustainability and, and forward movement and the ability to evolve. And, yeah. and that's good, right? That's, that's where I, you know, that feels good. Like I've, like I've done something good in my work. Yeah. Yeah. And San Diego County was talking about that yesterday. Like right when the pandemic started, all their executives were doing 18 hour days. Easy. Just every day, you know, for yeah. a long time. Yep. Um, because that's what it took to, yep. to just get ready. Um, but even they don't feel they're all the way through the real transformation of everything. And I don't think that transformation is going to finish for quite a while. There's still for sure not. a lot of districts that are grappling with this model, right? They're like right. trying to solve it with Google class or now we need an LMS. And then they're yeah. seeing, oh, we don't know all these little applets and apps and things sprouting up all over the landscape. And, and they're starting to observe that leadership is now not just people in buildings and it is you have to lead the digital universe and sure and, it, so, and it's it's not let everyone just do what they want but it's for leading. sure and, and it's actually interesting that you say that that we're even talking about about terms like transformation right because we've always said we've always said that this is a digital transformation not just because of the pandemic but what we've been working on for 10 years has been a digital transformation, not a digital transition necessarily, right? And so people with a transition in their mind are going, okay, yeah, we're going from a paper book transitioning to a digital book, except no, it's not at all that. It's a transformation. It's using, it's, it's working with technology to transform learning. The act of learning is transforming. And, and that's, that's huge. That's huge. And of course, it means 18 hour days for everybody, um, but it's necessary and we're going to get there. Uh, we just have to rely on each other to, uh, to, to get there, to leverage our, our, our own successes um, individually and help others learn. Yeah. And that reminds me, there was one other point that came up that was a really big point. And then we'll wrap up and 
pull Ellen into this, but um, one of the things that came up is that this thing, you know, everyone's iPhone, every child, they're all born with it in their hand, basically these latest, latest generations and their parents were too, right? The 30 year olds are all, you know, on that. Um, is actually also doing something else. That's another dimension that needs to be put into the reference guide the next time we put out the dictionary, which is the, the, the format of this is a uh, concise text or, or visual, which means it's short form and usually also short form visual. This is transforming the, the way kids are mapping their brains to shut off attention if it's not visual and it's not short form. So the long form teaching habits are in question. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, uh, these are the struggles that all of our chief, act, our, all our CAOs are struggling with that right now, um, for sure. I, I think that's a, that's, that's a fascinating um, second body of work. I think if there's some research done, that's, that's where that needs to happen because it's changing brains. Um, the, the fact that a device is changing how brains are mapped, that's fascinating to me. Well, it doesn't mean we're not ingesting information, the younger. No, no. It just means that the younger crowd is ingesting information in bits. Mm -hmm. Yep, just and, differently. And, and preferentially visually. Yep. Um, or like I said, bits of text. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you'll watch, and even young adults in most meetings, they go to a meeting and their phone is out after five minutes. <laughs> like, you know. They can't pay attention that long. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's affecting even our, our work in learning council with executives. Um, people just are not checked in that long hmm. unless it, there's a quick flip back to you. Okay. Now back to me, now back to you. Now right. back. To, right. So, yeah. so the whole methodologies we're looking at now as learning council research going, where does this thing go? What are the best practices going to be given short form visual. Right. Right. Yeah. You, and it'll be, teach? Yeah. and it'll be curious to see where, where our resource um, developers go with, with some of that, because a lot of our resources are not designed around that right now. Yeah. And, and so that's an interesting, then interesting shift, another interesting shift that they'll have to make uh, to, to meet the needs. And, and that'll be curious. I'm, I'm excited to see that happen. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be a huge undertaking, but I think we're going to have to go down that road. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been super fun. Um, yeah. We should probably wrap it up and get Ellen on board here to share from her view. I'm sure she'll have things to say if she's been listening in just on what we've been saying right now. But everybody who's been listening in or will listen in on the video, if you watch the whole thing, um, you can get a granted completion badge from Learning Council for learning everything that you just learned. So thank you for doing that. All right, Chris. Well, thanks for being with us. 